we have already met Emma and Jan. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Anne-Marie with us. Uh, she's a professor in dermatology and neurology uh, and the former CEO of Sahagenska University Hospital. Uh, also the government's advisor on competence within healthcare and a part of the Swedish Quantum Life Science Center. And of course your experience is very important since healthcare is a collaborator in R&D when it comes to putting use of other research that, that other people are doing. Um, healthcare needs to be involved in that, those processes. Uh, and also another uh, factor that the personnel at the healthcare centers need to be trained in how to use these things, which is another part of the competence issue. But um, before we start our talk, I would like to spend a little extra time with our esteemed guest from Finland because Sabrina, who is a professor both at uh, Quantum Information, Computing and Logic at the University of Helsinki and at Aalto University, um, which is now a full-time uh, CEO of Algorithmic. And I've asked Sabrina to tell us what her company's role is at this point in time when we're seeing this new technology emerging and becoming useful. What does your company do? Please tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Um, do you want me to present the slide or, or do you prefer to it, it's, it's up to you. Okay. If you want to, if you have maybe, something maybe, you'd like to present. Yes, yes, maybe I can, I can sure. share something. Take a few Meanwhile, uh, as I do so, um, I uh, will uh, introduce briefly, thank you very much for the question, I introduce briefly uh, the company what we do. So we, we develop um, software uh, for quantum computers which combines with uh, machine learning, AI, and uh, with uh, so-called uh, network uh, or bioinformatics tools. So it's a hybrid uh, software. Um, maybe, I guess, ah, yes, it will be, it's directly here. Yes, exactly, exactly. And I will say just a few words about it. Our mission really is, uh, we are a very um, a visionary vision, and the mission follows to reshape the future of healthcare by developing uh, quantum software uh, that will uh, eventually enable to solve unattainable, uh, unattainable challenges in chemistry, life sciences, and medicine. What is important, uh, I will just go through a very few points. Uh, one of them is that um, we believe, uh, we are not the only one in the world community, we believe that uh, eventually the ultimate exponential technology will be really the combination of quantum technologies, AI, and uh, another part is related to really HPC, high uh, performance computing, and for us this part is what we call the network medicine and network biology. Uh, and of course an important point is that uh, we do know that uh, quantum is a winner take all technology uh, and that therefore um, because we are at the verge of the first inflection point it's important to start early so it is really key at this stage to be prepared because we will face uh, scarce, uh, scarcity of resources in talent we know that talent is uh, not enough at the moment for this field uh, and also because integrating technologies is really Challenging. Uh, and one, I want to just show one, um, one slide which uh, highlights the complexity of doing software uh, for quantum computers. And, and in particular, this complexity has to do that you know there is a narrative according to which uh, we have a quantum hardware and the software application. But in fact, it is not so. There is a very uh, diverse stack, which goes all the way uh, to the control uh, of, uh, of, of quantum computers. And so this low level in the stack is what needs to be optimized to enable applications that are useful in healthcare and life sciences. Uh, and um, I think I will directly very quickly mention three use cases that may be of interest. The first one uh, is related to um, photodynamic therapy. So we work together uh, with IBM and Cleveland Clinic uh, in order to um, deliver a quantum advantage uh, in the um, photodynamic therapy, so for cancer treatment and prevention in particular. This is part of a, of a program um, in which we, are, um, we have been selected uh, by the Welcome Leap and Welcome Trust. So this is one uh, selected uh, application, which is, which is a timeline of 2026, so it's not very far in the future when we will run the first uh, experiments on optimizing protodrugs for, for photodynamic therapy. 
Uh, the second one uh, is an application that has to do with drug metabolism. Uh, and the, in this case, obviously the goal is the accurate prediction of metabolism time uh, in order to uh, enable optimal metabolic rate of drug uh, for patients. And this is something that we do together with another startup, uh, QCI. Uh, and in this case, uh, the important point is that this type of applications are on a different paradigm of, com of quantum computing that is so-called fault tolerant. Uh, and then uh, we were talking before about epilepsy, and in this case with Cleveland Clinic, with medical doctors at Cleveland Clinics, uh, we work to go beyond uh, machine learning uh, to, to gain a deeper uh, me mechanistic understanding of epilepsy, and in particular we compare um, the two categories uh, of uh, successful versus unsuccessful patient after surgery, uh, and we have algorithms that allow us really to gain, gain really deep in get deeper insight into why uh, this is happening, why in some cases um, really it is, uh, it's, uh, surgery is not, is not successful uh, and in others it has. And then the, the last use case, and then I, I, I will join you again, uh, is this is gene prioritization. Uh, and this is um, again something uh, in collaboration with our medical school. And in this case, um, what we are demonstrating with quantum algorithms uh, is that uh, it is uh, really possible to identify uh, in a way that is better than the classical um, methods already used, uh, key disease-related genes that are um, important. For example, one of the case studies is uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, and in particular, in this case, we, we could prove that the genes identified really had biological relevance. So this is just a, a series uh, I will conclude here, um, but gives an idea, a glimpse uh, of what uh, can be done uh, nowadays uh, for health and life sciences and what we are doing. Uh, and in particular. Well, thank you. Thank you. Lots of information and very short time. I was going to say, if this was the right call, yes. so when you asked, perhaps it was not the right call. Well, it creates even more yes. questions, which yes. is a good yes. thing. And I'd like to just uh, tell you all, for the ones that possibly haven't been here uh, with us before, that this is an open audience. You're invited to ask questions, make comments, just raise your hand. We're up here, we'll be talking, but I, I do keep an eye on you. So, this is a very confident crowd. Please make your voice heard. And, and I see Michael Nikita is here, where I come. We look forward to listening to you in a little while. Uh, I'd like to start with Amal. Uh, could you tell us your view of who the stakeholders really are when it comes to all of this that we're talking about? Yes, I could do that. I just wanted to say to Sabrina, because I reacted here on photodynamic therapy. I did my thesis on this. <laughs> and skin cancer and photodynamic therapy. I just had to say that. That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> That's really one of my, you know, this is one of my things. Okay, so so the stakeholders, what I would like to say is that healthcare is an important stakeholder. We've heard from, from from industry, from academia, but also healthcare and uh, all patients and all the staff, the co-workers. Mm -hmm. And I think regarding healthcare, I think it's the university hospitals that uh, have to be in the forefront here, uh, especially the R&D departments there, uh, to see, because I think we owe this to our patients to be in the forefront, and I was really scared when Epa, you spoke about AI, that we lost seven steps there, and, and uh, this is, uh, should not happen, really. So that's why we have to take uh, the torch here and really be in the forefront, uh, so yeah. Thank you. And um, obviously competence is key when it comes to, to uh, keeping this hotspot or what we're talking about, and it would be interesting to hear um, your view of what, what situation do we have in Finland, in Denmark, in Sweden, maybe Eva could uh, talk about that. Just to hear the comparison, do you think we're all right? Do we need more? Are we fine? What is your view on competence? Are you worried about it? Would you like to start, John? Yeah, I'd be most happy to. Thank you. Uh, I think I would, I would quote one of our professors on, on exactly that one, and, and he said that standing still is moving backwards. And uh, I think uh, we're doing fine uh, uh, when it comes to talent and educational and, and so forth in Denmark, but we cannot stand still, we have to move forward all the time. 
There's a number of new programs on quantum, especially that has been uh, invoked. There's uh, initiatives that brings together different uh, parts of, of the university programs within teaching. So that means it's not only physics. Of course, it breaks my heart to, to know that physics is not that important. That will solve all problems because it will not. Uh, it takes uh, chemistry, so chemistry is involved as well. And we have biology, we have uh, computer science, and we have mathematics. And you know, bringing new ideas into these worlds, I think, is in, uh, interesting and also important to solve real problems that we have just discussed and that's been moved forward here. So I think you have to have a very broad view on how to move forward all the time in this and compete with the rest of the world. The, the good thing about talent, if, if you can really generate a, a large amount, and I think that Nordics can do that, is that if you're a company and you want to put yourself here uh, in the future, uh, you go with the talent list. And if we have a good talent base, people would like to invest in our countries and would like to put having a Nordics that is known for you know, the high standard within that, I think, would be interesting. Certainly. And, and my added question would be, you mentioned a number of disciplines. Yeah. And they would obviously need to collaborate. Correct. Uh, are you doing that well in Finland? Uh, well, uh, of course, you mentioned something that is very dear to my heart because I think one of the key um, missions is to redefine programs uh, of education in a way to uh, make them much more uh, multidisciplinary by uh, really focusing on uh, how we speak across disciplines. And this, this language across disciplines is really specific and important in this field because quantum is a very technical and as you know, a field. So when we start to engage with uh, you know, chemists, but also with medical doctors, and in this field also with end users. Uh, then we, we, as scientists, we tend to speak a language which is very, very specialized and does not allow to communicate well. So uh, to have programs where there is also emphasis on uh, um, really I call it outreach, it's really not outreach. It's outreach but meant uh, to cross bridges across disciplines. It's something that should be emphasized. The type of programs, university programs, that we, uh, that we are developing are programs that definitely take into account <coughs> this novelty in a way, that is property of this field um, that requires uh, really um, the intersection um, of knowledge. Uh, and, and I think that this is key. Another aspect that is needed is, uh, is um, uh, to have, uh, for example, internships in companies, so uh, cross sectors, really, from, from academia to, to industry, uh, because we see that actually the majority of our PhD students nowadays, in, I'm talking now about quantum physics in particular, uh, they, they don't continue in, in universities, but they, they directly go to uh, industries and companies. And this is per se a good problem, I would say, but now I have again the heart of the, of the professor. But nonetheless, um, it is uh, definitely something uh, that, that needs to be, um, let's say, changed with respect to the conventional, if you want, the bachelor, or master, and PhD programs uh, that, that uh, existed before. And in Sweden, do you see this happening, this convergence of beginning of new programs, or is this something that we need to work more on? Uh, you mentioned the, uh, a couple of phases that were, I think many Jona did that, that were industrial PhDs, so the things that had to raise here in Sweden. But what is your overall view about for the situation in Sweden when it comes to competence and cross-fertilization? I think the part with the industrial PhD students could be really expanded because that is very, very useful. And uh, I think we're actually going to discuss today with some further companies that uh, are here regarding the possibilities with expanding within healthcare and life sciences, some industrial possibilities of industrial PhD students. I would also like to mention what uh, VACT is. Uh, Belgrade Center for Quantum Technology is very much pointing towards is that we have good quantum physics, but we really need to uh, have even more quantum technology education as well to be able to develop these technologies that we have been talking about today. And then I would like to also mention what uh, Lena Gustafsson is uh, very much pointing towards, the, the fact that we have to have competence developments within companies and within different uh, areas of Sweden and the Nordics to get the companies and, of course, 
like um, we're saying here, the healthcare, the hospitals, the university hospitals go in. Since it seems that healthcare and life science is a little bit first in line here, there are many, of course, other areas, but we seem to have healthcare and life science as a, as a powerhouse here in the Nordics. So reaching out, and like Sabrina was mentioning, the bridging between the quantum technologies and the healthcare and life sciences. And uh, Anne-Marie and uh, Lena and several um, uh, colleagues here are, of course, uh, working to, to bridge to get the healthcare and life sciences more interested in, okay, what is a qubit, how does it work, and what can we do with quantum computing, what can we do with quantum sensing? Well, it's quite obvious that there's a market, and uh, the market is called uh, people who need help that are uh, have a disease or, or need to be diagnosed better. So the market is there. Uh, I guess it's, it's uh, you were talking about early adopters. We would probably be like Sweden and the rest of the Nordic countries to have healthcare for our early adopters of new technologies such as this. Is. And I would like to ask, uh, go back to competence, which is also very much your field. Imagine we create these programs, an industrial PhD and so on, that, that works well. How do we make sure that they don't take off to some other country that maybe pays better, has better climate, possibly? Um, how can we not only develop, but also keep and attract this kind of competence in the long run in the Nordics? Yeah, that's a very important question. And it has to do with work environment. And also you talked about the climate. Maybe, maybe if it gets too warm in the south of Europe, so, so people come to the, the cold up here, so maybe we can compete there as well. Uh, yeah, we, 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 I'm, I'm the chair of a national um, council for competence, and we work on government assignments. And the, the latest one here is that we have a proposal for a national strategy for uh, healthcare workers and the future development of competence. And there are several things there that we, we, we have a 25 points that we, it's like a cookbook, cookery book. So you can just follow these 25 points and then you will have really good uh, uh, staff with you and also for the future. Uh, but one thing is the work environment, and it's also you have to have a good continuing education. That is one thing that we really point out, and here we are not doing too well, I would say. You also need career paths, and to take care of your senior uh, staff, so that they get different assignments, uh, you know, as they move along in the career stairs, so to say. And then one thing, uh, we spoke a lot about the Bologna process uh, several years ago, but unfortunately we can see, and that is one thing that we, we point out, uh, and that is that the universities, they have to work much more together regarding the different uh, education programs for uh, healthcare uh, persons uh, studying. So that is also one thing that we, we point out. And then we talk a little bit also about, you were talking about new pro programs, and then we have, we have Chalmers here, for example, and we started in Gothenburg, so there's the University Hospital together with Chalmers and the industry, uh, a combination engineering and medical doctors. So you get, a, 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 you, you get a mix here, and you get something new. So that is also one thing that you can combine the different uh, educational backgrounds, so to say. And you say um, the universities should work together a bit more when it comes to training for healthcare personnel. Is that for Sweden, or would you? Because you were talking about the Nordics doing that. I I think uh, that is one thing that we are not too good uh, here uh, doing too well on here in Sweden, and that is benchmarking. So maybe because we should know and take the the good parts from what you do, we just spoke earlier, you and me, yeah. what are the good parts from Denmark, from Finland, from Norway, from, from the Nordics that we can take and do the same and then combine the different experiences. So that is one thing. So, so for sure I know that in Sweden, the universities, they have to work much more together. And sometimes actually something that comes from 
outside could create an effect from the inside of working together better, so that might not be a problem. Um, you already do collaborate, right? Would you tell us a little bit about the learning collaboration that you have in Otomai Science? Yeah, we actually... <laughs> maybe I don't. <laughs> yes. Uh, we were fortunate enough to discover that there were very good things going on in Finland already in 2021-2020. And uh, of course in Denmark uh, with Lena Wunderseede, uh, she knew at that time that she would uh, finance a large program, but she didn't tell us, but she was really encouraging, yes, we are working in this area. So we started in 2021 with the Nordic Quantum Life Science Roundtable to share knowledge uh, between our countries and uh, to share these different projects because when uh, Sabrina is saying, okay, we're doing this in Finland and we start thinking, okay, th th that's possible, we need to work on that area as well and also to collaborate. So this Nordic Quantum Life Science Roundtable has brought us closer together and then we also have our, this is within Nordic Quantum Life Science, but then we also have within Nordic Quantum. And there we are also seeing that apart from that we are within one area now, within Quantum Life Science, we need to look at the infrastructure, of course, what we have been discussing here, the educational system. But really the infrastructure I would like to mention, since if there are heavy investments in production lines for different modalities, for superconducting, for photonic, for spins in, in um, Denmark, we have to think, okay, how is the supply chain going to work in the Nordics? And if uh, Sabrina and uh, Finland supplies all the cryostats, the fridges, the beautiful parts, <laughs> we're not going to start developing the fridges. So that, doing a supply chain analysis and really working together closer on that part, the fundamental, the hardware part as well, and then of course the software part and the application part, it's, we're getting there. So can we say that you together are, are working to identify where you need to do this and that, oh we're doing that, but you can do that, and, you know, have an analysis and suggestions, who's listening to you now? Do you have your your uh, bosses here at Novo Nordisk uh, or at the politi political level, or if you because the analysis is pretty obvious that you are very well suited to to do that. I, I think it makes a lot of sense as, as embassy to map out the um, strongholds and the competences around the Nordics. I think it's, it's a great idea. It has many different purposes, as Eva also says. One of the one of them is. If we want to make a strategy from for, for, for the Nordic perspective, we better have some data to do that instead of you know doing it sort of applying to her. The second thing that is maybe equally important is that, uh, which we have not really touched upon so much, uh, and, and which is a different discussion also, we are all part of nature, uh, NATO, and that means there's a security uh, sort of uh, dimension to this as well. And mapping out uh, strong goals like that will have a, a clear implication for the strategy that is currently going on in NATO on, on, this, on, in NATO on, on these issues. So I think there's, there's many different things and I, I'm pretty sure uh, that, that our governments will listen to that because there's a security dimension that is really important here as well. And security for governments is really important. And, and because I, I see that both the current government and opposition is here, we'll make sure that they'll bring that question to them because what I'm wondering is, well, at that level then, um, is it the Nordic Council of Ministers or who, who grabs the question who goes with it because it goes even further to security issues, it's big, uh, it needs to be taken seriously and they do have a very good partner in you, you know, offering uh, an analysis as I understand that you keep working on, right? So, so what would be other risks uh, or obstacles to working together in the Nordics that we should be aware of? Personally, I think that uh, certainly the fact of uh, having uh, different uh, areas of strengths uh, and combining them together will make a 
pursuing. So definitely this is uh, what, what should be um, even more uh, encouraged. I mean, we started this. Uh, I would like to see much more. Uh, in order to do so, however, um, I think personally that one of the main point is really uh, uh, aligning the national strategies because we have now, for example, in Finland we are um, finalizing the, uh, our national strategy, the, the working groups working on it, and uh, we are um, highlighting how um, quantum life sciences is uh, a strength uh, in the, uh, and should be uh, explicitly mentioned in the national strategy. And similarly, if this is done similarly and aligned, and I know that it is. Uh, this can bring, obviously, uh, the necessary coordination, um, maybe even at, at political level, because clearly our national strategy, I think also in your case, is done together uh, with the ministries in Finland, uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Industry and the Ministry of Education are both involved um, in, in doing this. So, that's my... <laughs> So we'll, we'll pick that up again as we, we talk to the uh, politicians in the room. Just to add, uh, I definitely agree with Sabrina, Sabrina there to, to have it on the strategy level and that it is really a strength in the Nordics with the healthcare and life sciences. Um, and one even more urgent part is the critical infrastructure and for example the health data. And that will be very. That is very similar already because we need to really understand that we have to mitigate these risks regarding uh, the harvest now in the later area. Since we need to upgrade and, and install these post quantum cryptos and understand where shall we have these uh, secure connections with uh, quantum key distribution, so that. That area, we have many similarities. I think we are extremely similar there. And also we have the same cultures, and now we're in NATO. So doing that to start off with as well is uh, critical. The US, like we mentioned, they've done this since 10 years, and it's, not, it's, it's a must for the critical infrastructure areas, the data to upgrade to these post quantum cryptos. So that is, uh, that is one thing. <coughs> Where we are very common. So this is a chance to actually move forward so that we don't stay where we are and just go backwards. Yeah. 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 I know there's plenty of people here that know a lot about health data and the issue of protection of health data and so on. Are there any comments to what have been said or questions so far? Yes. Sorry, I'm going to do like a politician. I will answer something completely different. Or <laughs> something <laughs> no, I'm, I'm very curious about uh, the thoughts from the panel and, and maybe Jan uh, in particular on the sustainability thoughts about this ecosystem because Denmark is investing heavily in sort of Sweden, etc., uh, to attract the future inventors, so to speak. There must be a plan for how the IP rights are protected by the inventors. Although it needs to be sustainable, so something has to go back to the to the, the investors, so to speak. So, could you comment on that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's a very good question. Uh, when we uh, constructed sort of this uh, Nordic uh, quantum computing program, uh, we were thinking exactly about those uh, issues. Now, uh, the Nordic Foundation is sort of a philanthropic, you know, uh, it, it's philanthropy. So that means that they cannot have any uh, sort of uh, gain on, on any of the activities. If they have them, it will be taxed heavily by the Danish uh, government, as all citizens are, by the way. But, <laughs> and so, so essentially what happens there is uh, we went in and looked at what kind, because if we want to sort of engage, as you also sort of imply in your, in your question, if you want to engage with sort of external partners, it could be a company or, or other uh, parties who would like to sort of you know, have IP rights to what they are doing and, and bring that into the center or to the production facility. They can't really do that because uh, you know, it belongs to university per definition once they get it in there. So the, the way we solved that problem was uh, that we made a non-liability comp uh, uh, company, sort of a non-profit company in the middle of, of it all called Quantum Foundry. 
that has uh, it's a non-profit first of all organization that means if you generate any profit it goes back into the and then at the same time it's a company it's a private company and that means you can actually deal with IP rights in the normal way that a company would deal with that so that means if your company from outside you want to come in and have things done in this uh, control foundry uh, production facility you can retain all your your IP rights so so it's, I would call it an IP neutral ground essentially in the sense that you can actually still retain, uh, retain all your IP. Then there's been a discussion about you know, how those researchers and, and all others engage with that uh, and that has to be, you know, that took quite some time to formulate that but that has been done as well. I think that's the, that was a crucial point in actually getting it to, to, to real life uh, rather than staying in the, in the university from all point of view. Uh, that Thank you. Did you want to respond as well as a company? I'm sure you're working a lot with your idea. Of course, of course. And uh, I think that if there is the will, there are solutions. This is a fantastic, uh, of course, solution. Uh, but I can say that we uh, work uh, with companies like IBM, for example. And in this case, uh, we need to be obviously very careful about the developed IP. And very often, when we uh, work together, it's really done in a blind way. I mean, our codes are obfuscated, they don't see it, and we don't see their code. It is possible to do it. Uh, it is difficult, because especially when you do um, you know, innovation at the level of R&D, very often, uh, it's, it's hard to um, really find uh, what is not working uh, if the hardware side and the software side are not open to each other, but it is possible, and it, we made it work. So there are ways and there are legal, um, let's say, subtleties that you can have in place to protect this type of um, cooperation. It's not ideal, and on top of that, uh, there is the issue of, uh, let's say, because of the geopolitical situation that in the end created uh, a lot to the, the boost of the quantum ecosystem, um, there are a lot of regulations that are appearing uh, when it comes to um, uh, any product uh, that could be or dual use, including uh, quantum computing. So there are additional uh, constraints that for a technology, for an early technology like quantum, are, are difficult to navigate. So as a, from the startup perspective, even if you're a small startup, uh, we have a, a legal council. Uh, yeah, you need to be careful. Yeah, we need to be careful. Uh, he's an expert in IP, uh, and is uh, and, and we also <coughs> work with uh, three different uh, legal offices for different things. But we have uh, an, we have employed uh, in the company early um, um, a legal uh, um, IP yeah. expert. Well, I, I think it's, it seems pretty obvious that this is an area which will generate a lot of, of both investments and then returns and people will be very very interested in, in being the ones holding the IP and so it's important for both companies and, and you know researchers in countries to be very careful of how we construct uh, and regulate around these issues. It looks like you were... <laughs> Go ahead. My normal uh, I would just like to mention as well that Netherlands, Germany, and France are going into a trio. And there are these constellations all over the world now, even though we are the sort of 12, 13 countries selected by the US. This trio of Netherlands, Germany, and France, they will be a strong trio. So we in the Nordics have to do our constellation and work together all the way from the hardware to the software and the quantum life sciences. And I think the timing is very good now because of course there is already competition. We are competing on, on, on people already, but still we are at the stage where we still share quite openly and transparently because we need to become stronger together. So that, that is most likely a good stage to really start these closer collaborations. Meanwhile, making sure that the Nordics are really the place to go for any young, bright person in this area that really want to go to the Nordics and we need to make that case, right? Communication. <laughs> Communication. There we go. Uh, I'm about to round up this talk. I'd like to hear you all tell us what do you see as the three most critical components necessary for the Nordic quantum life science ecosystem to thrive. Whoever's ready gets to go. 
<laughs> okay, the very first thing is that we need capital. Okay, let's not forget that we need a lot of capital to retain talent, to employ for, for IP protection, and for everything that needs to be deployed for this technology. Capital number one. We need, we need industry adoption. Uh, we need industries in healthcare and life sciences that become really engaged and customers, not just hire a PhD. Uh, no, but, but really uh, become customers uh, yes, uh, and, and collaborate uh, with, with the startups and, and with universities and so on and so forth. Uh, and, then, um, and, and this is key. And then obviously we need the, the government to take a de-risking um, uh, actions by uh, not only through the national strategies, but also becoming customers themselves, so uh, governments acquiring, uh, whether, whether it is uh, software or whether it is uh, uh, infrastructures, uh, in order to uh, de-risk the technology. This is not just uh, valid for the Nordic, so this is, I was recently um, discussing uh, at the World Economic Forum, uh, discussing preparing the agenda uh, for the Davos meeting uh, for the intelligent economies, uh, and it was uh, really the main starting point, obviously, was the reaction to the uh, Draghi report on European competitiveness. And the main point was what do we need to do really to boost European competitiveness, other than just making a report, which is of course useful, but what needs to be done. And I think that it's these three points apply very well also to the specific case uh, of the Nordics, even if they are much more general than the Nordics. Thank you. I very much concur, so I, I, I couldn't concur more. But I, I would probably say, uh, and, and I'm probably just rephrasing it, uh, what you're saying in a different way, but uh, a Nordic political vehicle for the collaboration that is needed so often, and a Nordic political uh, vehicle uh, would be important. Uh, have substantial funding, as uh, even uh, just mentioned here, the entire. Uh, let's look, uh, agreement between the three uh, biggest countries in Central Europe. <coughs> it's huge investment. It's like an amazing investment. And the last thing is talent, talent, talent. Yeah. <coughs> yes, and I stay in the, the competence field because I think uh, all those things, as you said, but also you have to have the, the competent uh, persons on the right <coughs> positions and to be in the forefront as well about the healthcare and the university hospitals. Uh, and we also talked about this. You have to have managers that know the field and has an academic degree. I must point this out if you are at the university hospital and being a manager. That is also something that we say from this competence council. Uh, is of great importance because then you know when to start collaboration and to be have a vision we must work together and you also can listen into because you can talk to uh, academia and healthcare personnel with the same words so to speak so I think that is uh, of great importance and then we have the research society you always collaborate I mean being a, a a professor in dermatology, I have friends all over the world, so to say. So they have to work together. But I think also, and I go back to the university hospitals, I think the CEOs and their entourage should also work together. For example, uh, Helsinki University Hospital, Copenhagen, and so forth. So also take that torch. Uh, that is so important, I would say. Thank you. Emma, you get the final word? Yes. <laughs> I agree, of course, with what has been said. I would like to add maybe two things then. That we have fantastic governments, we have fantastic democracies, and now we are on the verge of having our quantum strategies. Denmark has, Finland is in the making, we're in the making. There to choose some areas. I think that is an important thing, that we have to dare to choose that strategy. What are we good at? What should we go for? And then we will do our work from the quantum community and deliver. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>